So, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Mary Vickers uh, from AHDB, and I would like to welcome you to this evening's webinar. Um, this is uh, going to present some options for benchmarking antibiotic use on beef farms. Um, and the point of the webinar really is to, to um, bring to life the, uh, the details that are currently being described in an industry consultation document that, that, is, um, that can be found on the Cattle Health and Welfare uh, webpage on the AHDB website. Um, that consultation process is, is open at the moment and runs until the 23rd of August, um, and we're really keen to get as much feedback um, as we can. Um, the objective is to identify some recommended options for monitoring antibiotic use on beef farms, um, and we would encourage as many of you as, as possible to respond to that. Um, we know it's quite a technical area, so we thought a webinar would, would help to kind of go through those options. Um, so, um, as usual, we will take questions at the end of the webinar, but um, if there is anything you don't understand as we go along, do type your question in, and if I think it's appropriate to ask at the time, then I will ask it for you um, as we go through. Um, so, so do use the ask question function, which may be fairly obvious to you, otherwise maybe a, an orange arrow symbol at the top uh, right-hand side of your screen. Uh, so, uh, this evening we have two presenters for you. Uh, the first one is, is Fraser uh, Broadfoot, who's a lead um, on antibiotic usage with the Veterinary Medicines Directorate. Um, and the second one is Derek Armstrong, who's lead vet with AHDB. So, um, it's my pleasure to um, hand over to Fraser for the first bit of the presentation. Okay, thank you very much, Mary. Um, so my part, hang on, I'll just get the presentation going. Okay, so my part of the presentation is to talk about the two weight-based metrics that are included as part of the, um, ch the beef chore consultation document. Um, as you'll be aware, there's a lot more detail in the document. It was a it, you know, fairly long document, but our, the aim of this was to give a, a brief overview, really, of the key points within the document. So. Um, just so to make it a bit more easily understandable, hopefully. So the, um, the weight-based metrics we're going to talk about, we're going to, we're going to introduce two suggestions, possible suggestions, but both of them are, are based around a milligram per kilogram metric. And for this, we've called it a standard beef cattle unit, just to try and differentiate it from the um, other kind of metrics that are out there, in particular the population correction unit, and I'll, I'll talk about that um, in the presentation. Um, so basically with this presentation, the milligram part refers to the weight of the antibiotic active ingredient that you give, whereas the kilogram part or the standard beef correction, beef cattle unit, um, that refers to the average live weight of animals on the farm. The, um, the recommendation in the document is, to, um, is that there should be a 12-month 12 ben benchmarking period. So in terms of comparing antibiotic use between one farm and the other and another, it makes sense to have it in, in a 12-month period. Um, and that's mainly due to the, the seasonal management systems within beef farms, you know, the strict spring calving and the autumn calving herd, and also the fact that, that antibiotic use is, is likely to be seasonal on, on these farms as well, with probably higher use in, in the winter and in the spring. So, um, so comparing like for like, it, having a 12-month period is, is, is what we recommend in the document. And we also recommend um, splitting out usage by, um, by total use and also by, uh, by use of these highest priority critically important antibiotics. So these are the, the last resort antibiotics for human health. And, and during this document, we, we use the um, European Medicines Agency definitions. In other words, fluoroquinolones, third and fourth generation cephalosporins and colistin. And I should say, actually, when I, when I talk about we in this document, this, this um, document was put together by the, um, by the CHORG antimicrobial usage subgroup. So, this, so these are the kind of combined recommendations from, from this industry group. So talk, when we talk about weight-based metrics in general or the milligram per kilogram type metrics, so there are a number of potential advantages. Um, firstly, we do use milligram per kilogram metrics for monitoring national antibiotic use. However, it's worth saying that the, the figures that when we create this metric, it won't be comparable to the national figure because 
the national figure, we use um, a metric designed by the European Medicines Agency, which is called the PCU method. And that, in, with that metric, the weights used represent the average weight at time of treatment, whereas with this method, the uh, weight represents the average live weight of the cattle on the farm. So, so it won't be possible to compare the use. And, and similarly, the national usage figures only look at slaughter animals, whereas clearly for beef farms, not all beef farms have slaughter animals. So we had to come up with something different to, to the national system. However, milligram per kilogram type metrics are in common use in other sectors. That, so they're certainly used um, by the pig sector in their electronic medicine book and their um, benchmarking system. And it's, it's becoming quite a, a well-known language for antibiotic use across Europe and, and the world, really. Um, it can be, these kind of metrics can be calculated. It, you, it can be calculated from farm data, in other words, from the farm medicine record books but it can also be calculated using veterinary data, in other words, the supply data to the farm or prescription data to the farm. Um, whereas animal number type metrics, that's not possible. You, need, you really need farm data. And there's also some evidence that milligram per kilogram metrics do correlate quite well with dose type metrics, for example, measures of number of doses given. And um, there, there was some, some work on, on sheep which showed a, a very good correlation between milligram per kilogram and the number of courses given. So, so they, they can correlate quite well with, other, with those kind of metrics. Potential disadvantages are that the weight of active ingredient can vary by different antibiotics. So in particular, the, these critical antibiotics for human use tend to have a lower amount of active ingredient per course. And so potentially you could reduce milligrams per kilogram by moving to these type of antibiotics. Although that's one of the reasons we recommend separating out critical antibiotic use from the total use. So you have total use and then you have highest priority critical antibiotic use. And it may also not reflect the number of animals treated because if you treat smaller animals, for example, if you're treating calves, then clearly you give less antibiotic, a weight of antibiotic per animal than if you, eat adult, than if you treat adult animals. So um, it may not reflect the number of animals treated. And this is kind of a, a debate in the AMR world. You know, what's more important, the weight of antibiotic used or the number of animals treated? And we don't really know the answer to that. So, so there, there are some of the, the brief advantages and disadvantages of, of these kind of metrics. So let's, let's talk about this consultation document. So um, within the consultation document, there are, um, we've given you a, a, a form to fill in, which is a, a consultation document question sheet. And, um, and on that form, there's a number of questions. So I'm just going to work through that sheet and just explain what these questions refer to. So question one relates to how easy is it for the farmers to provide the information relating to antibiotic use. And for the first two weight-based proposals, the, the information required to do this is exactly the same. So there's only one thing to fill in there. And so in order to calculate the milligram part of the calculation, then you need to collect either the number of packs, um, in which case you'd need to know the pack size as well, or, in, or the volume of products sold, such as the mills of product, the kilograms of product, the number of boluses, the, depending on what kind of product you're collecting. So, so you need volume data. And, um, and as I mentioned before, this could be collected from farm medicine record books, especially if it's recorded electronically, that would be ideal. But it can also be collected from the, um, the vet practice management data, for example. Um, and so this part of the metric, the actual calculation is relatively straightforward. So you just, you just collect the number of the amount used, such as the milliliters or kilograms. On the product, um, the VMD, we have a list which, um, which says exactly how much millig how many, the amount of milligrams used per mil, the amount of milligrams of active used per bolus, for example, and then you multiply one by the other to, to get the total amount of antibiotic used. Um, Probably one of the things that's more um, more contentious is uh, which antibiotic should you include. So the um, the European Medicines Agency methodology that we use for national monitoring excludes sprays and excludes eye drops. And um, and in this document, we have recommended following that methodology. Um, however, if you consider products that are being used off-label, for example, if there are oral products that are being used off-label in foot baths, for example, then they will be included um, in this milligram calculation. So that's the first part of the calculation. And so the first question we're saying is how easy do you think it's going to be to get this data on, on medicine use, um, which either from the vet practice or from, or from the farm. However, the bit that's probably 
needs the most, uh, the, the most difficult part was not actually how to calculate the milligram bit of the metric, but it's how to calculate the kilogram bit of the metric. Um, because we know that beef farms are quite complex. Um, you know, some, some are derived from the, some of the, the beef animals are derived from the dairy sector, some are not. Um, you know, some go to calf rearers, some are more suckler derived. And so we know that it's, it's complicated. Trying to get a system that accurately reflects the weight of animals on the farm isn't easy. So this, this, take, this part has taken a lot of thought. And we've, um, we've, as a group, there are two, two options that are being proposed here, um, which we've imagined this to be called um, option one and option two. But the, the whole idea of this is clearly that if you you need to compare the amount of active with the weight of animals on the farm because it could be that the amount of active has gone up, but then if the, if the number of animals have gone up, then, that, then that's partly to be expected. So, um, so the, second, the second part of this consultation question is how easy do you think it would be for farmers to provide the information relating to the cattle population? Now, clearly, ideally, farmers wouldn't have to provide this information and you'd get the information directly from movement records. Um, However, we know that it's not always easy to get linkages to these movement records. And, uh, and so when creating these metrics, we've assumed that at least in some cases, the information will need to come directly from the farmer. So the idea of these metrics was to try and minimize the assuming that if you have to ask the farmer for some of this information, then it's better to try and minimize the amount of information required and the complexity of the information required. I mean, clearly in the future, if you have a system like an electronic medicines, but for cattle and sheep, that then developed full access to them to all the movement records then then we we will be able to improve the accuracy of, of the whole kilogram figure if that makes sense so let's talk about option one um so for option one the farmers have to provide um two key bits of information so the first key bit, bit of information relates to the um, number of cows put to the bull. And this is actually a common question for, for both options that we talk about here. So how many sucker cows did you put to the bull? For example, to the bull. And the second part of the metric asks for the number of animals, and it also asks for the number of days that these animals spend within these following categories. And I'll, I'll go through the categories that it asks for. Um, these categories have been created... Um, with, with 450 kilogram being considered the key cutoff between the growing and the finishing phases. Um, but it also takes into account the fact that, um, that some animals may be more intensively reared than others. So I'll go through the different categories. Um, the first category relates to the weaned conventionally reared beef calves. So, so the assumption up until weaning, uh, you, you, do, you don't have to measure them up until weaning because that's, that's the way in that weight of those animals is incorporated into the suckler weight which I'll explain later but th for this the farmer is asked to say how many animals do you have over the year have you had between seven months weaned conventionally reared beef calves have you had between seven months and 450 kilograms ideally you'd use weight but if the farmer doesn't necessarily weigh the animals or know the weight then you can use age and so the conventionally reared beef calves are um, become 450 kilos at 18 months that's the assumption that's made in this metric and then um, after that, they become conventionally finished cattle for the final um, uh, between 18 and 25 months, and so th so therefore the farmer has to say how many uh, how many how many um, animals do they have within that uh, within that category, and um, how many days have they spent in that category, and this is based on a calendar year. So um, it, if you look at this example, for, for example, then clearly over an, over a calendar year, then an animal may may have may move categories they may move from a conventionally reared to a conventionally finished cattle and in that case um the farmer will have to fill fill the time in for both that that animal will be in two categories and they'll have to complete the amount of days within each of those categories um the next category is looking at the uh the dairy calves so, so the so the pre-weaned dairy calves so um the so pre-weaned dairy calves represent the calves up to to 56 days and then um, these calves could, can either move into the weaned conventionally reared dairy calves. So these are those that will reach 450 kilograms at 18 months and will then become conventionally finished cattle. Or they could, um, if they're reared more intensively, then, they will move, then they will, the farm will have to categorize them as weaned intensively reared dairy calves, which will reach 450 kilograms at 12 months of age. And then 
after 12 months of age, these will move into the intensively finished dairy cattle categories. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. So these are the, the different categories that are proposed in this metric. And the farmer has to say the number of animals within those categories and the number of days within those categories. Okay, so that's option one. For, um, for option two, it's a, a slightly different approach in that the, um, the main focus is actually our, is the bit about suckler cows is the same. So they asked to provide how many cows and heifers did you put to the bull? That's exactly the same. But the, um, the other questions relate to how many were actually li left the farm. So how many were sold to the farm, either for slaughter or not for slaughter. So, for example, if the farm is a suckler herd, suckler farm, then they have to answer how many cows and heifers did you put to the bull? How many of these um, homebred cattle, we're talking about ones that, cattle that were born on the farm, how many of them were sold not for slaughter? And they're, and they're asked to give an age, either less age range, either they were sold at less than one year, sold at one to one and a half years, or sold at greater than one and a half years. And then the next question relates to those that are sold for slaughter, with, including the same categories. But, um, and then finally, they're also asked about um, how many how many animals so if those that are born within this calendar year which 2018 in this case how many do they expect to retain for breeding so how many every year do they do the farmers retain for breeding so that's the suckler herd bit um this option two metric um also has some questions if the farmer has a calf rearing enterprise and it's similar questions so how many dairy origin calves were sold not for slaughter and then using the same age range and similarly how many were sold for slaughter? So that's a similar kind of questions, but this time relating to a, the calf rearing part of the enterprise. And then um, finally, this is the growing and finishing part um, for farmers that have to buy in cows and, and either sell them for slaughter or not for slaughter. They're also asked to provide the age when leaving the farm. But one of the differences here is that as well as providing the rough age when leaving the farm, they also provide the age banding when arriving on the farm as well. And this is to to make it possible to take into account um, roughly how long these animals are actually on the farm, which is important, as we'll see later. And then similarly, this is the same thing, but how many were sold for slaughter? And then again, giving a rough age bound as to when they arrived on the farm and when they left on the farm. OK, so, so that is that is the information that uh, that is the information that the farmers need to provide. So I'll just give a brief case study. And this is a very simplified case study. Um, we know that in, in reality, or we all know that in reality, bee farms are more complex than this, and, and a lot of them have mixed enterprises. Um, so this, this is a simple example that's been created just to um, explain the basic principles. Um, in the consultation document, we do include a more complicated, we do include a calf rear example, and we include, include a mixed enterprise example, just to give an idea of, of some of the complexity in, in some of these farms. So this is a very simple example. Um, so this farm puts 25 um, cows to the bull. Um, it reared 20 calves in 2016. Um, 17 were slaughtered at two years, um, with three replaced and three kept as replacements. Um, 2017, a similar number, slightly higher number, more calves reared. And in uh, 2018, there were 22, 22 uh, calves born as well. And, and every year, three, three are kept as, as replacements. So if we look at if we look at option one, um, okay. so if we look at option one, so with this metric, so we're um, assuming that they're born first of May, and therefore that they become weaned at seven months of age. So so in in this example, we've assumed that they become weaned on on let's say first at first of December. So that's at the point at that point. If you look at the option one, that's the point at which they become these weaned conventionally grown beef calves so they become weaned beef calves okay and then um they're weird conventionally and then in this example they become um these conventionally finished cattle that happens at 18 months of age okay so um and then they get slaughtered at four months of age as shown here so that's the kind of first of may so so if you look at the um 200, 2016 calves for example um so in the, within the recording period of 2018, those that were born in 2016 were on the farm for, for as um, conventionally finished cattle for four months. Um, those that were born in 2017 were on the farm as um, conventionally grown beef calves for most of the year um, for 10 months, and then they they become 
um, they become finished cattle. So I'm it's, it's blocking my slide. <laughs> they then become finished cattle towards the end of the year. Um, whereas the um, the 2018 farms, um, they become weaned cattle for one month at the end of 2018. So um, so in that case, the farmer would fill this in. Um, they'd fill in the number. You have to look at all of the batches. You'd fill in the number that were on the farm during that, just during 2018 and the number of days that they were on the farm within those categories. And as you can see, within the 2017 batch, these animals did switch categories during the year. So you have to fill in um, the animals within both categories and the number of days that they were within those categories. I hope that makes sense. Um, with option two, uh, slightly different. With option two, part of it's the same. So you put how many cows and heifers you put to the bull, um, but then you, you, you only record how many animals left the farm and so in this case there were 17 in 2018 there were 17 animals that left the farm for slaughter and they were slaughtered at over one and a half years because we said they were slaughtered at 24 months and um and then the other part of the metric we say of those born in the last year how many do you expect to be obtained for breeding and the answer to that in this case is three um so this is yeah this is just a, just a reminder that this is focusing on those animals that left well on the well on the suckler cows and also on these animals that left for slaughter. So the obvious question with, so, so that, that, that's part two, that's what information the farmer has to provide. So that's the question two that you have to ask. But then the other important part is, how accurately do you think these metrics will reflect antibiotic use? So I'll just explain um, how, the met, how this kilogram bit is calculated. So for, in both of the metrics, the, when, the number of, cows put to the bull is multiplied by 779 kilograms and this is this is a weight that takes into account um the the weight of the pre-weaned dairy calves up to seven months it takes into account the weight of mature bulls on the farm so you make an, there's various assumptions made such as that there are 90 calves weaned per 100 suckler cows there are four stock bulls run per 100 suckler cows put to the bull so there are various assumptions made but this is a, a composite metric and the weight of 779 reflects not just the weight of the suckler cows, but also the weight of the pre wean cows and the weight of the bulls on the farm. And we've used that in both metrics. Um, the other, um, for the other categories, however, what you do is you multiply the number of animals by a standard live weight for that category, and you also adjust it based on the time spent in that category, which I'll explain. So for option one, you can actually base it on the actual time because you're asking the farmer to provide the number of days that the animals spend with each, within each category. However, for option two, we do not ask for that information. And so therefore, we have to make an estimated time based on national averages, which I'll explain. So this is for option one. Um, so, in this, so for the number of cows put to the bull, there are 25 cows. Um, the average live weight uh, used in this case is 779 kilograms. It is assumed that these suckler cows are on the farm for, for the whole year. And so we don't, ch we don't change that weight. So literally we multiply the number of animal cows put to the bull by 779 kilograms to get to this, this figure of 19475. Um, however, for the conventionally finished cattle, I'm, I'm, I'm here looking at the literally just the, the 200, 2016 batch. So they were only conventionally finished cattle for that year. There were 20 of them. Um, they were only in that category for 120 days. So the average live weight of that category as a whole, um, in other words, the, the time from weaning to um, the time, sorry, I'm getting confused here. The, the conventionally finished cattle, that's uh, from 18 months, so from when they get to, to eight. 450 kilograms to slaughter so the average weight within that time period is 528 kilograms however we don't multiply the number 20 by 528 and that's because they were only on the farm for around a third of the year so what what we do in this metric is we adjust it accordingly so we we would we've reduced the weight assigned per animal by to, to basically a third in line with the time that they were spent on the farm so this is a way of helping to take into account the time that the animals reducing the weight if they, if they don't spend as much time on the farm, which I think makes makes a lot of sense. Um, and so if we do that for all of the batches that we talked about, and we add the final figure, then we get the overall weight of animals on this farm for this particular option. Okay, so that's the um, option one. For option two, 
um, we do not ask for time on farm. And so, but depending on the answers that, that are given, there is a standardized weight that, that, that is assigned. Um, so for example, for the cows put to the bull, it's 779 kilograms in both cases. Um, for the cattle sold for slaughter over one, one and a half years, then we give a weight of 647 kilograms, and I'll explain that in the next slide. Whereas for those that are retained for breeding, we give a weight of 551 kilograms, and we multiply that weight by the number of animals within that category, again, to get a final weight of animals. And you can see, actually, in this case, we come, with, we come up with very similar figures for both options. Well, that's not always the case, though. So the, the main question with option two, so option one, clearly, you know, you are, the farmers asked for time on the farm. Option two, they're not. So then the question is, how do you account for the time on the farm or the live weight of the animals that don't leave the farm? Because not, animals don't, not all of the animals are leaving the farm over the year. So how does this work? Well, what we do is we assign a standard time on the farm based on the information the farmer provides. And the, um, the consultation document gives a lot more details as to how this has worked out for the different scenarios. But in this case, if, if it's a homebred cattle that's slaughtered at one and a half years, then the assumption is that it's uh, a conventionally grown cattle and the assumption is that it's slaughtered at 24 months. And this is based on, um, on, on national averages for, for this, this type. Um, and so what you do is you say for um, the average weight of this category is, uh, is 457 kilograms. And that's based on an, an, an average standardized weight at weaning of 274 kilos and an assumed weight of slaughter at 640 kilos. So that is the average um, weight of that, of that category while it, is a, while it is alive, effectively, between weaning and slaughter. Um, that, the cattle that leave the farm, they have been on the farm for, so they're slaughtered at 24 months, they're weaned at seven months, so therefore they've been on the farm as a weaned cow for 17 months. And so what we do is we actually, um, rather than multiplying the number slaughtered by four, five, seven kilos, we actually increase the, the weight. So we say that um, by, we multiply the weight by the number of years that that, that, cattle, that cow leaving the farm has been on the farm. So in this case, you do 17 divided by 12, multiplied by 4.757 7 kilos, and you get, that's where you get to this 6.47 kilo weight. So the reason why you, you put this extra weight onto these cows is to help take into account the weight of the animals that don't, within that category that don't leave the farm. Um, and I'll just show how that works here. So, so for example, if you look at the, these 216 cattle, as I've said before, they were only on the farm four months before leaving. However, these cows that were born in 2017 were on the farm for 12 months um, as weaned cows um, during 2018. And the calves that were born in 2018 were on the farm as one month, uh, for one month during 2018. So therefore, in total, actually, there are animals within that category for uh, over the year for 17 months. And that's why in this case, you, um, you, up, you increase the weight accordingly to take into account those animals that don't leave the farm. Now, it does make a number of assumptions. Um, it does actually assume that the farming system and pattern is relatively, is pretty similar year on year, and um, that isn't necessarily the case. So, so there, are, there are assumptions that are made with this metric, although there are assumptions made with both metrics, to be honest. Um, so then you get the calculation. The calculation itself is very simple once you've done this calculation. So you divide the weight of active by the um, weight of live weight of animals on the farm, and in this, in this particular example, you get a very similar figure. Um, that's not always the case. And, and we do have an example, a calf rear example, in the appendix of, our, of the consultation document that does produce a slightly different figure, and we explain why. Um, so this brings us on to the final question, which is question four of the document, which is taking into account the uh, balance of, so the first question, one of the first questions related to how easy is it for the animal, for the farmers to provide this animal number information. The other question is how accurate do you think it is? And then you, then the, the most difficult one is trying to balance out the two things. So the, the balance between ease of getting the information from the farmer and the accuracy of the information that you get. And so this is what question four is about. It's trying to, what, what on balance, which one do you think does the best job? And we know that there is, Given the wide variety of beast systems, there's no such thing as a perfect metric that will cover all systems. But 
our aim is to, to create a sensible balance um, of accuracy and, and being accurate and also being pragmatic. So, I mean, it, you, you can vote on these systems. You may think that, that neither of them are, are any good, potentially, or, or you may think that um, you, know, you like elements of one, elements of the other. Um, so we have included extra questions. So please, in terms of the feedback, if you don't like something, tell us why. Um, and if you have another, another suggestion, or if you just think that one or other metrics can be tweaked or in any way, then, then any feedback is welcome. So we're not completely wedded on, these, on exactly following the, these metrics, but these are, these are the ideas that we came up with. And, um, and so we're putting it out there. We really want feedback from, from everyone who's got an interest in this as to uh, know what they think. So um, that, was, that, that was my presentation. I appreciate that this is quite a lot. This is um, quite a difficult thing to get through in a relatively small space of time, but hopefully that helps clarify things and, and clarify things that are within the consultation document when you get a chance to read it again afterwards. Thank you very much. Fraser, there was one question um, raised during um, your presentation, and it was about cold cows. Um, it was actually raised when you were talking about option one, but I suppose it really refers to, to both the options. How are cold cows accounted for as they wouldn't be put to the bull but could still be on the farm? Well, and sold. I suppose they're sold for slaughter, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, um, you would only... Yeah, the... the So these are cull cows that are that then beaten beef cows or these are the ones that are sucklers. So Yeah, I suppose they've been weaned um yeah. and then decided and they're cold, that yeah. it's not yeah. they're not worth to breed again and then they're sold. Yes. I mean I think they should still be included in the sold category. So you'd put in for for option two I think you would put in when they were sold and the age at which they were sold. And then for, um for the option one you would still you would still include them. I think you would still put in the time that they were on the farm. You'd have to decide which category they're in, and then then say how long they were on the farm until they were cold. So I think I think you would include them. But the one the one that um, possibly isn't included is if, if farms buy an in calf heifers, and that's something that someone did bring up as well, which is um, possibly is not dealt with. But I don't know how significant that would be. So I guess you would include, the person, so the person who asked that. that Okay. Sorry, so the person who asked that question has come back and said, so these cows are rearing a calf but not going back to the bull. Okay, so they've calved. Yeah, so so they wouldn't be in the bulling group, but they'll rear, rear that calf to weaning. And then, so I suppose effect, effectively they're a finishing animal really in terms of category, aren't they? Because they'll be sold for slaughter. Um, so an yeah, this, in is a, an this is an interesting one because um, I would have thought they... I don't know if they would be included or not, because the suckler cow, you would presume that if you then another another uh, the, when it when an animal then so if you're rearing a replacement, it will then become a, a come into the suckler cow metric um, when it's mated, so maybe about 24 months. But yeah, if, it, if it's just one that's had a calf and then doesn't go back, I'm not sure if they're counted. I'm not sure. It's a good, good okay, question. so that's a very good question. We'll have to have a think about that one. Um, there's another question here about how how you deal with uh, mixed enterprises of cattle and sheep. Yeah, no, this is a very key point. Um, the, I mean, in the document, what we say is that what we say is that we um, we recommend that that practices that if it's, for example, vet data, you should try and have different sub accounts to try and separate out beef and sheep use. Because um, we know that obviously a lot of the beef farms, probably about forty percent, maybe of them have have sheep. And so, but ideally, you would you'd have separate sub accounts on the on the if it's vet data and if it's farm data. I guess the farm can say whether it's been given to a sheep or a sheep or a cow. So that's less of a problem. Um, we haven't really dealt with the sheep issue here. I, I know I have heard some people talk about coming up with a combined beef sheep metric. And for the sheep sector, the sheep sector are coming up with their own with their own sheep metric. So I guess it's possible if you can't separate use by beef and sheep, you could have a combined metric. But ideally, ideally, all we can say is try and separate out whether products being sold onto the farm for a cow or for a sheep. 
It may okay, be worth I'm mentioning gonna, that the maybe worth mentioning that the sheep in Shog, the Sheep Health and Welfare Group, published their their metrics for sheep today, and they are available to download from the Shog website, shawg.org.uk. Thank you. Yes, so, sorry, Derek, I will get on to There's just one more question um, on this subject of, of mixed enterprises. So this one is about a dairy farm that's rearing um, their calves for beef. So again, um, what, what would you recommend there? Okay. Um, so I think in that scenario, so, so in terms of the dairy bit, there is a, um, there has been a dairy metric that's, uh, that's been put together um, which is based on the number of, which is based on the number of dairy calves, um, sorry, the number of dairy cows on the farm, um, multiplied by a standard weight. So, so there, there is a, that, that is the metric that's been put together for, um, for dairy farms. Ideally, I think it'd be better again, if, I mean, if, if it's not possible for the farm to split out beef and dairy use in terms of antibiotic usage, I guess you just have to go with the, the dairy, just to say it's a dairy farm and use the dairy metric. But ideally, you would separate out the the, uh, the beef calf rearing part and the dairy part. So you'd separate out the usage, and then you'd have a dairy figure and a beef figure. And I mean, th this metric yeah. does work. This metric does work for. Um, well, I mean, in both metrics, they, they they do work for for calves reared for dairy calves reared for beef. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, we're going to have to um, move if you on. Can't separate it up, then, yeah, it's tricky. Sorry to, sorry to keep things moving, but I want to give Derek plenty of time to go through the other options. So we've got two more options that um, Derek Armstrong is going to uh, present, um, and, and I can see the time ticking along. So um, I'll hand over to Derek now. Thank you, Mary. I'm going to cover the animal-based metrics, and there are two of these. One looks at the percentage of animals treated, and the other looks at treatment days per animal. Animal-based metrics look at how many animals were actually treated with antibiotics during the year rather than the weight of animals. And the advantage of that is that each animal is treated the same. So you could have a bottle of penicillin that would treat 25 calves or one adult bull. Um, and using the treatment, the animal-based metrics, you can see this more easily. There's no need for standardized animal weights. And the metrics can also be applied to other medicines, such as anti-inflammatories. And some people may find it easier to understand and monitor progress in animal health and in reducing use of antibiotics. But that's what we want to find out from you. Is that what you think? The disadvantages are that you need information from the farmer's records. You need it from the medicine record books on farm. It cannot be calculated using supply or prescription data. So the only information you have is how many, how much antibiotics have been supplied from the by a, by a vet practice to a farm, then it's not easy to use the animal-based metrics. And the advantage that each animal is treated the same is also a disadvantage in that the amount of antibiotic given is then not being considered. So again, your, your bull, your 1,000 kilogram bull is getting his full bottle of penicillin and that could have treated 25 calves so that um, doesn't come out when you just have treatment days and exactly how much antibiotics has been used and it may be that with these metrics that what people prefer is a combination of metrics to give them um, the best value. So the, the first metric is the percentage of animals that have been treated over the calendar year so for that you need the number of far cattle that were on the farm during the calendar year and for this, we ignore the animals that were sold, and we simply count how many animals were on, how many cattle were on the farm on the first of January, how many were registered as born during the year, and how many animals were bought. That gives you the total number of animals that were on the farm during the year, and then of those, how many were treated at least once with antibiotics. And the percentage then is simply the number of animals that were treated with antibiotics over the total number of animals which have been on the farm multiplied by 100. So it's a relatively straightforward calculation. Say so you, you use the, the animal medicines record book and you work out, you can work it out just for the whole farm. So on this farm, 11 of the 91 animals which were on the farm during the year were treated with antibiotics, which is 
you can break it down then by category as well. And you have two of the 25 cows, three of the calves that were born in 2016, two of the calves that were born in 2017, and four of the calves that were born in 2018. So you can see which age category of animal um, used the most antibiotics or were needed the most antibiotic treatment if you look at it in that way. So it's a relatively simple metric. The advantage of it is that you can see from year to year whether a greater or lesser percentage of your animals were treated with antibiotics. It's obviously potentially difficult for farms where everything is treated with antibiotics. One, so if you have um, dairy cows that were treated with um, oxytet on arrival at the farm, then all of them may have been treated so you have 100%. Um, and then it's difficult to see um, whether or not other diseases needed treated during the year. Move on then to the other animal-based metric, which is treatment days. This is a recognized metric in human medicine, um, where it's called days of therapy. And it's usually standardized there with a denominator such as the 1,000 patient days. And it has been shown in um, some research on the human side to correlate well with defined daily dose. However, this work has not been done with treatment days for animals at this stage. What you need to calculate the number of treatment days per animal is the number of, again, the number of cattle that were on the farm during the calendar year. So once again, it's the number of cattle on the farm at the beginning of the year, plus the number that were registered as born on the farm during the year and the number that were bought in during the year. And then all you need then is the number of doses of antibiotics that were used to treat cattle. So every time that an animal is treated with an antibiotic, so it gets an injection of antibiotic, if it's a short-acting penicillin injection, for example, that's one treatment. If it's treated for three days, that's three treatment days. If it gets a shot of um, teramycin LA, a long-acting product, it's counted as three days. So one treatment in that case would be three days. So, sorry. So in this case, the treatment days per animal is the number of days that the animals were treated with antibiotics divided by the total number of animals which have been on the farm during the year. Again, you use the, the medicines book. And in this farm, if we look at it, and there were 28 treatment days. The 91 animals were treated for a total of 28 days. And so that works out at 0.3 treatment days per animal. And once again, you can break that down by the age category of animal to see which age of animals are using the, the most antibiotics. Um, another way of calculating the number of treatment days is to count up the number of animals that were treated, the number of days that they were treated on, and then the duration of treatment. So if we had 10 cows that were treated with oral chlorotetracycline for three days, that would be 10 animals were treated for three days, and the duration of action of the product was one day. So that was 30 days. If it was Draxin, you, you treated 21 weaned calves with one dose of Draxin, there would be 21 cows by one treatment by um, three days because it's long acting, which gives you 63 treatment days. So you count up the number of treatment days and you divide it by the number of animals that were on the farm. And then you can see over the years whether you're using more or less treatments of animals during the year. And it doesn't matter whether you overdose or you underdose um, because we don't really know whether um, that, whether it's the risk of antimicrobial resistance is greater if you underdose or if you overdose. What is happening is that you're exposing a bacterial population in that animal to antibiotics when you treat it. And whether it's, you, some would say it may be more of a risk when you treat young calves because their bacterial population may be changed for the rest of their lifetime. Others might say, well, it's more important if you treat the animals just before slaughter because um, it's nearer to the point at which um, they're likely to enter the food chain. We don't really know, so we're just treating it very simply as the number of treatment days per animal as, as the proposed metric. So the, the advantages of using treatment days is that there are no complex calculation of dosages or kilograms of population corrected unit required. 
you don't need any hypothetical averaged weight of animal. You're simply treating every animal as an exposed microbiota. The disadvantages are that you have to separate out your long-acting products from your standard um, duration of action products. Um, if you use combination products, if it's a single formulation such as um, trimethoprim sulfa or penstrep, that's simply counted as one treatment. If you give it two antibiotics, so if you give it an oral dose of antibiotic and an injectable at the same time, that on the one day, that would be counted as two treatment days. And obviously, the treatment day um, metric treats heavy animals getting a large dose and light animals getting a small dose as equivalent. So that's just a quick introduction to the percentage of animals treated and the number of treatment days per animal. The idea at the end of these metrics is actually to provide beef farmers and vets with something useful that they can use to actually see, get a better idea of what's happening on their farm. So you can produce tables like this. This one is being done with treatment days, but it could be done using some of the other metrics that Fraser presented earlier. And you can break it down if you've got the information in your animal medicine records book by, by age group. You can look at the number treated in each category, the percentage treated, the total number of treatment days in each category, the treatment days per animal, and the treatment days per treated animal. And that's just an, an example of the type of use you could make of the data. Another use you could make of the data is to break it down by the reason of treatment. So you could look at the number of animals that were treated for mastitis, lameness, pneumonia, scars, etc. And you can look at the different categories. In this example, we can see that the main problem in the older cattle was the treatment for mastitis. In the calves on milk, it was scars. And for the other age categories, it was mainly respiratory disease. Again, just an example of how you could use the data if you um, provide it in that format. And we can also provide it in graphical format and we can compare your farm to maybe targets that would be set or against other farms of the same type uh, within your region. And you can do that for all treatments or for um, the critically important antimicrobials. You could look at it again by the, um, by the disease or the reason for administration, your use as against the, the average for other similar farms. You can do it by age group. Um, on the farm, so are you, where are you using more relative to other farms of the similar type? And then you could look at the different type of antibiotics that you're using and what you're using compared to, again, other farms within the region. So that's a, a quick look at how you could use the data. As I say, these have been shown for treatment days, but you can develop similar um, outputs for the other metrics as well. Just a reminder that we'd love you to actually give your give us your views on what's happening on the benchmarking of antibiotic use on beef farms and how you think we could um, best do that. The consultation is open until the 23rd of August. All of the details are on the website, chog.org.uk, chawg.org.uk. And on that website, you can download a copy of the consultation document and there is a link to a response form where you can give your responses or you can email those directly to Joel. So thank you very much. And back to Mary um, for the questions. Okay, yes, yeah, so we've got, we've got a few questions. So um, Derek, just going back um, to when you were talking about how you calculate the numbers of animals on the farm, there's a question about do you need to take account of any animals that have sold or died? No, at the moment we don't. We just say it's simply the total number of animals. I think um, in a few years' time when the livestock information service is up and running, we may be able to refine these metrics and they would actually have um, specific, we'd hopefully be able to create a download where people could get the actual figures and when we get to that stage, we may be able to, tr to change these metrics to um, adjust it to 30, 60, 365 days so for the animal year. But at this stage, um, for simplicity's sake, 
we're just counting the total number of animals that were on the farm at any point during the year. And um, we don't, we ignore the number that were sold during the year, but at a later stage, we can refine the metrics to take that into account. But it's something again in your consultation, if you think that's important, um, we'd love to hear from you about that. Um, and then there's a couple of questions um, around uh, assuming that the long-acting antibiotics all last for three days. Um, a couple of people are making the point that's, uh, that there's a lot of variation in products. Um, and is it fair to count everything that's long-acting long as, as a three-day, um, as three days? Well, for simplicity's sake, um, we've done that. Um, again, if it's something that people feel strongly about, we have the capacity within the EMB database to actually um, put in a, a specific duration for each product. But the advantage of doing it, having a simple thing, is that actually this is something you could do on paper just by going through the animal medicines record book without needing anything more sophisticated than a, than a pen and paper to, to do that. Uh, if we make it, if we start treating everything differently, then you'd have to start looking up tables and trying to work that out. It's something that could be done. And again, if people feel strongly about it, it's something we can look at. Uh, so someone's come back and said, uh, presumably the short acting antibiotics will always be given as a course anyway over three to five daily doses. Well, that's the... I think the advantage of the, the treatment days metric is that it it takes what's actually in the animal medicines record book. So if an animal was only treated for two days or if it was treated for seven days, um, you know, you, you that's picked up um, from the records and you put that down. It's not making any assumptions that people do as they're told or that they follow um, the recommendations on courses. Obviously, we'd love it if everybody did follow best practice but we know that it doesn't happen in every case sometimes the calf can't be found because it's on the other side of the mountain um but actually as long as that's recorded in the animal medicines records you're using actual usage you're not making any assumptions okay um and there's a couple of, of points which um i'll read out i think probably we've covered them but but just to be clear so um Somebody is saying, um, in using the milligram per kilogram live weight as the major metric, does this fail to underline the difference between treating 500 kilo calves versus one 500 kilo cow in terms of disease incidence and treatment? I, well, I'll comment and then leave it to Dr. Fraser, but I think it doesn't make a difference in the milligram per kilogram metric because it's ultimately about sums up the total milligrams that are used on the farm and it counts up the total number of kilograms of animals on the farm. You can, as with treatment days, probably break that down to different categories of animals as long as you've um, used something like an electronic medicines book that shows which category of animal was treated and what and their age at the time of treatment. Have you anything further? Have I got that right, Fraser? Yeah, I don't have anything more to add because, the, as, we, as we said before, the, the metrics that we talk about here are um, talk more about creating a farm level figure. Um, and so, yes, it will be if you treat a, it's, it's done by amount of active given. So clearly, you a small treating lots of calves, you might give, you might treat lots of animals and end up giving the same amount of active ingredients if you treat one adult. I mean, that's a, that's a potential disadvantage of, of these milligram per kilogram farm type metrics. Um, I mean, I think, it, I think the metrics can be adapted as, as Derek said, if, if we did get very detailed farm level data and knew the ages at which animals were treated, then I think you can, you can adapt the metrics and then come up with a, a figure broken down for different age groups. But primarily what we were consulting here in this document is, is creating a farm level figure. And, and, and we're, not, we're not necessarily saying we'll, we'll just have one, we may recommend one or two or three that you know tell you different things so, um, so that's what we did with dairy wasn't it so, so it may be that actually you, you know you look at a couple of metrics to get a feel for, for different um, aspects of how the animals are treated um, 
I think so probably someone... milligrams, milligrams per kilogram may be um, the most useful farm level metric and the some of the animal based metrics may be more useful for actually breaking it down into um, subcategories within the farm. But that's what we want to hear from you. That's, that's, that's only our view. We'd really um, like people to think about how they would apply this on their own farms or with their own groups of farmers if they're vets and how it would work for them. Yeah. Um, so uh, we're nearly out of time. There's just a couple more uh, points I'd like to just, just um, read out. So, so another person here just saying that they do commonly um, uh, do uh, antibiotic benchmarking for beef and sheep farms with a separate sheep uh, uh, tool and, and a separate beef tool. So, so basically they're, they're separating out the, the use and, and, and do it separately uh, for the same farm. So, so that's interesting to know that people can uh, and do do that. Um, and then there's another person here saying, um, once the replacement for BCMS is up and running, how long will it be before medicine use becomes mandatory and which metric is likely to go forward to this? Well, I, think I don't think we know is the answer no, to that. But, um, we don't know, but we, the Cattle Antimicrobial Stewardship Group have made it clear that it's a long-term objective of the industry to actually move to um, getting a good handle on national use of antibiotics in cattle. And that and the, the government are indicating in their um, national antibiotic plan that they expect the industry to actually um, have a much better handle on how antibiotics are being used on all for, forms of livestock farms. And the, the benchmark has been set for us by the pig industry and the poultry industry who are capturing 80 to 90 percent of their their farms and through red tractor it's already a requirement for for beef and dairy farms to review their antibiotic use on an annual basis and we would hope that some of these tools would actually um be, be beneficial and useful um in doing that um so that actually our what we would like is to have metrics that are not simply there because um it's a, another chore to be done. We'd like people to look at them as, as how can we use this most effectively to improve animal health on our farms? Because ultimately we can only reduce the risk of antimicrobial resistance if we improve the animal health on farm. And by using the, um, by looking at how we're using antibiotics on farm, hopefully we can identify where changes can be made to improve animal health and reduce the need to use them the following year, which should also improve productivity and performance on farms as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you very much. Sorry, Sorry. I was just going to say one other thing. Um, I, yeah, I agree with everything that was said there. Um, in, in terms of, I mean, there are two distinct things here. What, one, one thing is, is the requirement for collecting use for national monitoring, and the other one is for benchmarking. And so this, this consultation is, is, is about benchmarking, which is completely it's kind of separate from the national monitoring requirement. But what we do know is that, um, I mean, we are wanting to, working with sectors to, to get accurate usage data. And within the new um, veterinary medicine regulations, um, which, came, which was uh, introduced in the beginning of this year and comes into force within three years' time, it does include a, a stepwise requirement for collecting antibiotic usage data by sector. So this will eventually include the include the cattle sector. So it will it will become a requirement that we will need to get antibiotic usage data by sector. We're still waiting. Or however, we're still waiting on the, the exact details as to exactly what will be required. But but um but certainly in probably you know, well three years time that the the VMR becomes a comes into force and then 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 it's stepwise. I think probably we're still waiting to see exactly when when it'll when usage data will be required from cattle, but it may be as soon as two years after that. Thanks. Great. No, sorry to, to butt in. Okay, so I think we've um, covered all the questions now and we've we've um, got to eight o'clock. So um, just to thank uh, Fraser and Derek for going through their slides and taking us through that. It, it, it is quite a complicated area and they did a brilliant job of explaining it. Um, just to uh, repeat that we'd love you to um, give us your feedback on the consultation. Um, just just have a look on the, on the TORG webpage and, and um, it should be quite clear what you have to do to do that. That, that is open until the 23rd of August. Um, 
anyone who's registered for the webinar tonight will be sent a link to our, our YouTube channel with, with a, um, a recording of the webinar in the next couple of days. So um, you, can, you can listen again if you, if you want to. Um, but now all that remains for me to do um, is thank you very much for, for joining us this evening um, and wish you a very good rest of the evening. So thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.